This is an area where the surgeon and the non-surgeon have uh, a great deal of overlap. It's shared territory. Uh, surgeons classically have uh, been involved in the removal of tissue or removal of disc, whether it's a disc herniation or whether it's a fusion operation. And what Doug is gonna talk to you about is uh, techniques that allow for preservation and uh, improvement without uh, surgical resection. But all of us need to have the ability to measure what we do using similar instruments to measure so we can see where the real benefit comes in and where our non-surgical colleagues may be making advances that you cannot make uh, with a knife. Uh, so Doug, uh, would you go ahead? Thank you, Neil. Okay, so I wanna start out with what we're demonstrating today. This is called Viadisc NP, and this is on the market. It's a 361 product, uh, and it's paid for by Medicare, TRICARE, and uh, uh, some other insurances. And this is called Viadisc NP, and this should be contrasted, Viadisc NP should be contrasted with Viadisc. So Viadisc NP is 100 milligrams of micronized disc material mixed with um, two and a half cc's of normal saline and the, the same mixture mixed with six million stem cells is uh, via disc. And Doug, for clarity for the audience, 361. Yeah, so human cellular tissue protocol, 361, minimally manipulated homologous use. The 351 is not that. That has to go through a BLA or biologics licensing application. And so that's where that ViaDisc is going, regular ViaDisc with the cells. That's where products from Mesoblast, Dysgenics, BioRestorative, these are all going through the BLA pathway. So something that we have now uh, is available. And so this is for people with back pain, discogenic back pain, and it's for modified firmin grades three through six on the MRI, one or two are normal, you don't care about them. Eight is a disc dust, so basically anybody that has anterior column pain. One of the downsides I see about anterior column access is uh, it's age-related. The people uh, essentially under about 45 haven't done very much of it. Over 45 have because that's when discography was uh, very popular. And so this, it's a somewhat of a challenge for our younger colleagues because most of the training programs don't teach disc access anymore. And I'm going to show you disc access it's gonna be painfully simple. The other thing I see is that people don't know how to recognize anterior column pain very well because we haven't really traditionally had treatments for these, you know, treatments have involved posterior column pain, facet injections, rhizotomies, and uh, you know, a close colleague of mine said, you know, uh, most of the back pain comes from the posterior elements. And I'm, I, you know, I told him, I said, I love you, man, but that's just not true. You know, up to 80% of the pain will come from the anterior column between 70 and 80%. And so the presence of abnormality on MRI, midline back pain, being 55 or younger, and positive sustained hip flexion physical examination test, these things give you a 94% positive predictive value that the pain is coming from the anterior column. So that's something you can put down those four things and a positive sustained hip flexion test. If somebody puts, lays on their back, puts their legs up, and you put about, about a 45 degree angle and they let them down slowly, if that causes a back pain, that's a positive sustained hip flexion test. And so with that, I'm gonna demonstrate um, disc access. You can use a double needle technique, meaning an 18 gauge needle, followed by a 22 gauge needle through it that's curved into the disc. Uh, I don't use a double needle technique I never have. I use a 20 gauge, but I'm going to show you an 18 gauge because this is easier to see. So an 18 gauge needle uh, has the notch on the one side, and it's the same notch as the opening, and it slants away. The tip of the needle slants away from the notch. And so typically I will bend it coincident with the bevel of the needle to exaggerate the natural steering tendency of that needle because it tends to steer away from the face of the bevel and toward the point of the bevel. So I just put a little extra bend, half centimeter to a centimeter from the tip, and this exaggerates, exaggerates the steering capability. And so with that, I'm going to uh, show you the screen, and we have a shot here. I don't we think we need to take another one, and I'm going to um, ask Steve to go 30 degrees oblique toward you. Uh, 30 degrees rotation toward you. And what we're doing is we're, we're trying, pardon? Uh, toward you, yeah. 
the eye eye towards you, yeah. What we're trying to do is make sure the superior articular process is between one third and one half of the way across the end plate above it. So we can take a picture here. Um, so push, oh, yes, perfect like that. So you can see the SAP that the needle is directed toward the superior articular process is between more than a third of the way across. So between a third and a half of the way across, and this is a good oblique. And so my start point picture will be picture will be just anterior to the SAP. And ideally, I would like to come down and hit the SAP picture. So I have some semblance of de depth and I can feel the SAP right there. And remember the needle is bent. And so as I take it, it steers away from the notch, my, my notch is facing this way. And so the needle is driving toward me and I can feel the SAP here. So I take the needle, flip it 180 degrees, get it past the SAP, flip it 180 degrees again, and go into the center of the disc. Picture that. And so now I'm fairly close to the center of the disc. If we could take an AP shot here. And we're looking for the needle to be in the, close to the center of the disc. Can we take a lateral shot, please? And so check on that. And keep in mind the nucleus pulposus where you're trying to inject this is the center two-thirds of the disc. And so you don't have to get it exactly in the center, but it, it, helps, it helps make you feel better to be able to inject this. So there we go, dead center of the disc. And so I'm going to take the stylet out and the via disc NP comes in this. And the, the fluid is added to this. This is mixed up according to protocol and it, given time to rest. And then it's drawn back out. The, the top of this is um, able to be punctured with an 18 gauge needle and the liquid is drawn out and we already have the mixture done and it's drawn out here. So I'm going to go ahead and inject directly into the needle and so before we do this, I want to take, uh, take a picture there. So, all right, so we have it, and I'm gonna inject the material in there, and I want you to watch, before we take a picture, keep your eyes on the end plate and watch what happens to the end plate's picture. So it pops up, and you can see the motion, and this is how you know you've got a good injection when the disc will actually pop up. This has been studied with hysteresis curves, and so the micronized disc material mixed with saline turns into a gel, and it actually is, uh, supports the surrounding structures, it resists uh, compression, is biomechanically um, stable. And so after this, you pull the needle out and that is all there is. That's disc access with injection of via disc NP. Questions, comments? Uh, Doug, just initially, uh, as part of the workup, is there any um, use for uh, an anesthetic uh, discography? Uh, so something besides imaging and clinical exam to indicate appropriateness for patients. So that's a great question, Neil. So I, I haven't done provocative discography in probably a decade and a half or more, but I do anesthetic discograms on every single person. I mix 10 milligrams of dexamethasone and uh, two cc's of preservative free lidocaine. I mix these together and it's about roughly uh, three cc's of fluid. I inject it into the disc. I'm looking for how much pain goes away. As I'm injecting, I'm asking the patient, is this the same as your typical pain to get a concordance? And, and uh, the preservative free lidocaine will numb the uh, pain receptors, but until it does that, you can actually reproduce the patient's pain. And if uh, for some of you who don't do anesthetic discography, not only does it diagnostically absolutely confirm that you're injecting the right disc, it's a, a good warm-up tool to be able to access the anterior column with disc access. And then, as I tell most people, uh, inject the anterior column, do anesthetic discography, it will change your life. Once you see how powerful it is, and the pain reduction goes from an eight to a zero, for example, or a nine to a one, uh, you won't be able to forget it. Uh, I'm not going to hog the mic, uh, but I will ask one more question. In uh, the realm of orthopedics, when you are injecting corticosteroids into a contained space, whether it be the hip, the knee, the shoulder, uh, uh, the uh, surgical access to that space is usually um, uh, abridged until an, a time interval has passed because we've found on registry studies that infection rates uh, are altered. Uh, have you had any experience with um, 
uh, with that, uh, uh, do you, uh, is there a time interval between the time of your injection of a corticosteroid into a known disc and when you're gonna treat it? So there is not, and that is not known okay. yet. What I use is 90 days picked arbitrarily out from some of the other literature that uh, Neil just yeah, referred yeah. to. That's, the, what, that's what we use, and it's arbitrary. Yeah, it's arbitrary, so I don't like infection. To be able to do this, to prep people, I usually give people a little bit of uh, sedation to do this, MAC or moderate sedation, you don't have to. But I do give them antibiotics. Like my typical cocktail is one gram of ANSAF, uh, and 80 to 100 milligrams of genomycin. If somebody's allergic to penicillin or one of these things, uh, I swap that out for 600 milligrams of clindamycin. If somebody's allergic to some of this, I give them one to two grams of vancomycin based on weight. I do this perioperatively, IV with everybody. I hear a lot of people say there's a high risk of uh, discitis and disc infection. Look, that just is not true. It is not true, it is not true, it is not true. We, I've participated in, I think, 14 of these studies now. We have never seen a discitis when somebody used perioperative um, antibiotics. And, and my non-randomized, non-placebo controlled study of my own opinion, I've never seen a discitis. I've, uh, I've got the Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours of injecting discs, and I've not knowingly ever seen a discitis. So, so I think the, the risk of that is real, it's clear, but it's way overblown. Questions from the audience? Doug, I think uh, we're, we're concluded. Great Thanks. job, bud. Thanks, guys, appreciate it.